Well, welcome to Night Church tonight. Um, I'm Carly and this is Mark, um, and we're excited that you're gathering with us tonight. Um, a special welcome to you if you are watching over Facebook um, or if you're live streaming from our website. In your house. In your house. Or you might actually be in the church building right now. In the house. In the house, <laughs> gathering together, which is such a lovely blessing. And so welcome to you if you're doing that. Uh, this term, uh, we've been looking at the, uh, God's big story, the big picture of the Bible. Uh, and it's been interesting, hasn't it, to see uh, that the, the story of the Bible is actually one of God uh, drawing near to his people, mm. um, coming close to them. Uh, when, we, when he created us and we turned away from him, he is constantly making moves towards his people in love, um, in affection, in mercy and grace and kindness. Uh, and so tonight we have the privilege um, of joining together, as gathering together, um, uh, as, as the people of God who are near to God. Uh, and he, he, he is coming to us tonight as Dan um, is going to be uh, speaking from, from his word. Um, and so um, it's, been, uh, it's been good to, uh, to see the fulfillment of all things in Scripture in Jesus as he has come down and literally dwelt among us, dwelt mm. with us. Mm. Um, and so um, it is good now for us to confess um, that, uh, that, that truth, that um, God is near to us, uh, that he's uh, gentle and merciful to us. Mm. Um, and so let's pray together. Lord, you are our shepherd. We confess that without you, we are lost sheep. But Lord, you are our shepherd and we lack nothing. You make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside quiet waters. You refresh our souls. You guide us along the way of right paths for your name's sake. And even though we walk through the darkest valley, we will fear no evil, for you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil, our cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in your house forever. Mm. Amen. Amen. Well, as Mark said, uh, we've been looking at the big picture of, um, of the Bible and of God's story. Um, and the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at some topics and just how they kind of play out in today's world mm. uh, in light of that big story. Um, and tonight is no different. We're going to be looking at technology. Um, so I wanted to ask Mark, what's the first thing you think of when you hear technology? Um, satellites, and Wi-Fi and internet. Internet. Yeah. Uh, you got there. I, I'm not sure I would think of satellites, but that is a technology. Um, I think of internet. I think of smartphones, iPhones, um, having the internet on your phone, um, just the incredible convenience of technology. Um, well, Dan is going to be thinking through um, all those sort of um, big, big um, parts of the Bible, big parts of God's story, and and how we actually see technology in them, and how we see God using technology ultimately um, for our good and for our salvation. Mm. So, and it's yeah, mm. not with a smartphone, obviously. Um, so, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Yep. Um, and uh, Colin is now going to. Uh, uh, bring us a new song mm. and so let's sing together. Hi, I um, wanted to sing a, a, a relatively new song and um, it's a very simple song about uh, a truth that's, that's simple yet deep and that is that, um, that Jesus is strong and kind. That's what the song's called, Jesus Strong and Kind. Um, the thought that if Jesus was strong, if God was strong, but he wasn't kind, he wasn't good, then there would be no comfort for us um, if we couldn't be sure that he cared. If Jesus cared, if God's, God was love and he wasn't strong, he wasn't able to do anything about it, there'd be no comfort in that for us. But uh, what a blessing to know that in the character and greatness of God, 
He is both strong and kind. God is good and God is love. And uh, we meet that most wonderfully at the cross. We meet that most personally in Christ. And we've been learning about the big story of the Bible and um, what a comfort it is to come to Jesus by faith and to know that although the world is a, a mixture of fear and worry and strife and sickness and sin and death and failure and hardship and heartache, that we have a God who is good and mighty. Jesus is strong and kind. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy. said if I am weak I should come to him no one else can be my strength I should come to him for the Lord is good and faithful he will keep us day and we can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Jesus said that if I fear, the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. G'day everyone, it's Michael, one of the ministers here, and I'm here with Pat Coffey, who's one of our regulars at 10.45. Uh, over the last uh, little while, Pat's been preparing our growth group studies for Term 3 from the uh, Old Testament book of Daniel. 
And so we thought we'd ask Pat uh, what's been exciting him about Daniel, what he's looking forward uh, to getting into. So, Pat, yeah, what's been exciting you? What's the big picture of Daniel? Yeah, so, uh, well, I guess I'm excited because we're doing Daniel straight after we've studied the big picture of the Bible, and I think that's really helpful because Daniel, being Old Testament, um, some unusual things in it, knowing where the context is, who the people are, really helps our understanding. So just picking up on God's, one of the themes, God, you know, God's people and God's place under his rule and being a blessing to the world is really helpful because as we look throughout the whole Bible, we see that, I guess, a highlight under King David, uh, everything's really good, but things decline pretty quickly. And over, over the coming years, um, eventually they get exiled and uh, in, in two batches, batches by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. Mm. And at that point, you really could be questioning, well, is God able to fulfill his plans? You know, God's people, they're not in his place. They're not under his rule. Are they even a people? And they're certainly not a blessing. So you really got some big question marks at that historical point. And that's yeah. where Daniel steps in. Yeah, so Daniel's answering those questions. Mm. Uh, so it's a book that we know, you know, um, you know it's about lions and, uh, uh, trees and statues and all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff in some of the chapters. Uh, mm. But um, uh, those things are easy to get distract, uh, easy easily distract us in the book of Daniel. Uh, what have you found helpful to keep coming back to as you've been? I think, I think our, our theme, you know, the, the king of all kingdoms is really helpful in that regard because, again, you're coming back to God's big picture and saying, well, what is God up to? He's trying to deal with sin. He's trying to restore people in his place under his rule. And you say, well, Daniel, it's looking pretty low ebb. But all the dreams and the messages and all of the things keep pointing to, don't look at the, 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 the amazingness of what you can see, but look to God and what he's up to. And you see it time and time again. God is able to humble the proud king. He's able to um, establish an eternal kingdom. And he's able to bring in the end of sin and uh, an eternal righteousness. We can learn about all of that and even the resurrection in Daniel. In the Old Testament, he's looking forward clearly to Jesus. And I think once you start seeing that, you go, wow, that unifies the whole book. But it's also a huge encouragement because it's not. God is able to control everything, and history included. And so COVID or anything that makes you worry, you go, well, actually, I've got something in Daniel that makes me remind, remind me. And I can look back historically and see God was able to do it in the past. He can continue to do it. So I, I find that really encouraging. I think that really helps. Uh, I guess to avoid some of the distractions or, or some other complicated issues, the book is quite clear in that regard. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, it should be, should, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It sounds like you are as well. Uh, so, friends, make sure you uh, grab a copy of the Growth Group Studies. Uh, you can get that on our church website. Also on there you'll find uh, a second document that um, Pat's put together for us, uh, which will help to, uh, as you're reading through, help you to orientate yourselves with regards to the historical context of what you're reading, how it fits in with other parts of the Bible as well. So make sure you download one of those, keep it alongside as you're reading Daniel. Uh, but we have a, a great term ahead of us. Um, thanks for sharing, Pat, and we'll cool. see you soon. All right, thanks. See ya. Good evening. Uh, my name's Michael, the minister here at Night Church. It's my privilege tonight to be able to lead us in prayer. And we're going to begin by confessing our sins to God, knowing that Jesus has freely forgiven us. Uh, to do that, I'm going to use some of David's words from Psalm 51. So if you'd like to bow your head with me, let's pray together. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions. Wash away all our iniquity. Cleanse us from our sin. Father, we, we know our transgressions and our sin is always before us. Against you, you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Father, forgive us. We thank you that in Christ, his death and resurrection, you have cleansed us. You have made us clean. Father, in his blood, you have washed us. So now in your sight, we are whiter than snow. Father, fill us with joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. For you have uh, hidden your face from our sins. You have blotted out all our iniquity. 
a God creating us a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within us. We thank you that you will never cast us from your presence. Never will you take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and grant us a willing spirit to sustain us. Father, you are the God of all nations. And so we pray tonight for our country, Australia. Direct and give wisdom to our leaders at this time as they seek to guide us through the complexities that COVID-19 has brought. We ask too that they might seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and that we may be free to live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And Father, we pray that you use us, your people, to bring many Australians to a knowledge of the truth about Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for many. Father, it is a joy and privilege to partner with our mission partners, your servants who have gone across our country and beyond to the world. We thank you for raising up Wayne and Mandy Oldfield in the Northern Territory, for Karen who's gone to the Middle East, Kurt and Beck out at Lightning Ridge, Mal and Carissa Forrest in Jordan. Father, for the forests, we give thanks with you that the COVID-19, uh, with them, that the COVID-19 situation appears to be under control in Jordan. As they're able to meet together again face to face as a church, we ask for wisdom that they'll be able to do so safely, but especially that their meeting as uh, your people will be a time of encouragement and building up, equipping them to reach out together for the glory of Christ. Almighty God, you are the giver of life and health. And so we pray for those amongst us who are sick and unwell, for those who are hurting or lonely, whether it be through the loss of a loved one or even through divorce or even abuse, for those struggling with unhappiness in marriage or singleness or whatever it might be. Father, where repentance is required, make us willing. Where reconciliation is needed, enable us to forgive as you in Christ have forgiven us. Be our strength and comfort in every difficulty and struggle. Enable all of us to experience your generous love and to be renewed in our relationship with you. And finally, Father, as we come to read your word together, we pray that our love may abound more and more as we grow in knowledge and depth of insight so that we might be able to discern what is best, that we may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus. And we ask all these things in his name for your glory and praise. Amen. Hello, I'm Bob from Night Church. Tonight it's my privilege to read God's Word and we're reading from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the, the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith established and firm, and do not move from hope the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard, and it has been proclaimed uh, to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant.
Hi, I'm Dan and I'm one of the ministers here at Ingerdean and Heathcote Anglican Church. This term we've been looking at God's big story and seeing how the whole Bible fits together. And now we're going to consider what the big story of the Bible has to say about our use of technology. Technology is a confronting topic because technology, it surrounds us. When we define technology as the reordering of raw materials to be used for human purposes, well, we come to see that it really is everywhere. Technology includes not only the digital devices we are now confronted with everywhere we go, but also the seemingly primitive technologies such as the wheel or maybe your kitchen utensils. See, technology was used to create the fundamentals of our languages we speak in and write in, to create the software and hardware which allows me to preach to you through this camera and your device. Technology is being used to illuminate the rooms we're in via electricity and light bulbs or even a fireplace if you've got one. My relationship with technology is probably best described as a love-hate relationship, and I suspect I'm not the only one. I love that my phone is this digital multi-tool, allowing me to call, text, search the web, read my Bible, check my emails, create to-do lists, take photos or videos, listen to music, and so much more, and always in my pocket. But I also hate how much time I spend on it, doing everything but what I should be doing in the moment right now. In fact, while I was writing this sermon, I had a few moments where my phone kept interrupting my study to notify me of emails or messages that really could have waited until later. I've also found that using the Bible app on my phone is less helpful for me when I'm reading. I prefer a physical Bible, and yet, for convenience sake, I sometimes don't bring my Bible places because, well, it's already on my phone, right? See, it's not uncommon that we treat or use technology unhelpfully. Yet God, in his goodness, doesn't leave us to wander the complexity of handling technology alone. Through the story of the Bible, we can learn lessons about technology from the great creator himself. And as we look at God's big story, it's easy to see that it incorporates the reality of technology. Even the images for our sermon series move from a garden to a city with the technological advancements of writing on stone, the construction of the temple and the advancements of language represented all along the way. So today, we're going to do a biblical theology of technology by considering what the overarching story of the Bible has to say about our use of technology. So let's dig in. Firstly, in the opening pages of the Bible, we see the pattern of not only the kingdom, but of technology. See, in the first two chapters, we see that God is a creative God who, unlike us, can create new technologies without even the need of raw materials. He speaks a word and things are created. But we also see that he does choose to use creating raw materials also. For in Genesis 2 verse 7 and uh, in Genesis 2.22, we see him use the dust of the ground to create man and the rib of the man to create woman. But the amazing thing about the creation story about technology is in Genesis 1 verse 27. Here it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. And as little image bearers of God, it's good for humanity to bear God's likeness in their creativity. For when they do this, they're bringing glory to God. In the garden we see Humanity's creative abilities are so God-glorifying when they're put towards God's good purposes which he has given them. See, technological creativity is a way that we mirror the image of God. We mirror his creativity. But it doesn't take long in the Bible's pages for God's image bearers to decide that they don't want to live under God's rule anymore. And by chapter 3, we see God's image bearers take a bite at becoming godlike at deciding for themselves what is good or evil. And when they did this, they lost the blessings that came with living under God's good and perfect rule. And now humanity receives the curses that come from disobeying that rule. And because of this, we see two big developments in technology according to the perished kingdom. Firstly, we see the technology is no longer just used to bring glory to God, but also to fight the consequences of the curse. The curse that we have brought upon ourselves when we disobey God. In Genesis 3, we read that man under his own rule 
is cursed to work the ground. It resists him through bearing thorns and thistles. Women, they're cursed with the pain in childbearing. And all of us are cursed with shame and nakedness and death. But technology can be used to push back and fight the impact of sin, can't it? Farmers, they use weed killing technologies to minimise the curse upon men. Doctors, they administer pain suppressing technology in childbirth to reduce the curse on women. And fashion designers can use fabrics to cover our bodies. See, technology, it's a gracious gift from God to help us live in a fallen world. And yet, no amount of technology can undo the very curse. And so death and judgment for rebelling against God's good and perfect rule, that still looms over humanity. Now, secondly, in the perished kingdom, we see technology begins to be used against God. And this is seen at its pinnacle in the Tower of Babel at Genesis 11. Here, humanity works together to build the Tower of Babel. More than a skyscraper, the Tower of Babel is a city unified around a temple, which is the tower itself, and it's all dedicated to the worship of human progress. Babel really is a tower of humanity's arrogance and ignorance. Mankind builds a godless skyscraper and they do it using God's resources and God's creativity that was put into his image bearers. And what do they do it for? In an attempt to make a name for not God, but themselves. As the story unfolds, we see the humour in humanity's rebellion against God when man builds the tower as high as they possibly can, only for God to still have to stoop down in order to evaluate the progress. See, it bears the image of a parent stooping down on their knees to see the huge tower which their child has made with blocks. And we're still building towers today. Ours are made out of computers, phones, social media, medicine, and much more. Yet all of them, like the Tower of Babel, can be used to glorify humanity instead of God, using what God has given us. So what is God going to do about man's technological rebellion? Does he have the power to stop it? The answer is yes. Even after evaluating the Tower of Babel, God disrupts humanity's progress by dispersing them and mixing up their languages as a form of judgment for their rebellion. And so by chapter 11 of the Bible, we see that technology can be used for God's glory when his image bearers properly use it as he would have them use it. But it can also be used against God's purposes while never being outside of God's sovereign control. But most critically of all, we've seen that humanity's use of technology can only dampen the effects of the fall at best. We can never remove the curse we've put upon ourselves when we rebelled against God. But God doesn't leave us to this hopeless situation. He promises to redeem us from this. See, in Genesis 12 to 17, we see God step into the picture with the promised kingdom. See, in that part of God's big story, he gives a promise to his people that one day he will restore them back into a blessed relationship with himself. And so as we follow God's promises to bring us back to the rest that flows from obeying his rule, we see that the partial and prophesied kingdoms unfold. And it's in these kingdoms, in this part of God's story, where we discover that mankind can even use good, God-given technology for their own evil purposes. In the development of the temple, we see the building technologies of humanity were not only used to build the Tower of Babel in rejection of God, but could also be used to glorify God in the construction of his temple under his plan. The temple was the height of new technology. It shouted to the nations the glory and magnificence of Israel's God. But humanity can twist even the good technology of the temple towards their own evil purposes. The temple was later used by Israel as an excuse for sin and as a false security for worshipping other gods. God speaks through Jeremiah the prophet to Israel and he speaks in judgment in Jeremiah 7 when he says, Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known and then 
come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we are safe. Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. The very temple, meant to glorify God by shouting to the nations how great and magnificent the God of Israel is, was being used to shout a very different message to the other nations. It was shouting that the God of Israel, he excuses evil practices and isn't worthy of total devotion. What hope then is there for humanity to reverse the curse we put ourselves under, to reverse sin and death when, well, we can't even use God's good technologies for good. It's in this low point of God's big story in which Jesus enters the scene. And through Jesus, we see the greatest technological marvel in the most unlikely of places. Through Jesus, we see that God can use man's evil technology for his good purposes. See, when good technology is placed into our hands, it gets used for evil. But so too, when evil technology is placed into God's hands, he can use it for his good purposes. And this is never more clearly seen than at the cross. See, the Roman cross was designed to kill, to separate and to humiliate. But look in awe at how God uses the Roman cross in Colossians 1, 19 to 20 from our Bible reading today. Paul says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Instead of being used to kill, separate, and humiliate, God uses the cross to bring life, peace, and glorification to Jesus, and not only to Jesus, but also to those who trust that Jesus' blood was shed on the cross in their place. And so the punishment for rejecting God's rule over our lives, that punishment has been paid for by Jesus, with the receipt being his resurrection, giving proof that death is defeated. In this, we can identify the Bible's two most central teachings on technology. Firstly, we see that man's use of technology, even man's use of God's technology, can never save us. But God is so great that he can even use man's corrupt technology to save us. And secondly, we see that technology is never used better than when it's used according to the will of God. When we try to use technology for our own purposes, it gets misused. But when we consider what God would want us to do with technology, well, then it can get used for marvellous things. See, through one of humanity's most evil technologies, God undoes the curse that humanity could never undo, even with the greatest of technologies. The implication of this part of God's big story is huge. The implication is that we should never treat technology as a saviour. It will never save us from the pain of living in a sin-stained world. Only God can save. So don't fall into the trap of thinking happiness, security, and the undoing of the curse in any way, shape, or form can come about through any form of new technology. The joy of a new gadget or a phone, well, that joy is only ever at best temporary. But the joy that God gives through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, it's eternal despite the circumstances you're in. See, no amount of pain and suffering can completely eradicate the joy found in the Christian. For the Christian knows that even if they die, they will live, just as their Saviour died on that cross and rose again three days later. So we now live in the proclaimed kingdom, and we can choose to live in light of Jesus or not. We can choose to trust in technology or Jesus for the undoing of the curse. And because God has poured out his spirit on us and given us his word, the Bible, we can now, by God's strength, be better equipped to use technology for his glory rather than our own purposes. The Christian doesn't trust in the false security of technology. They trust in Jesus because Jesus doesn't just push back the consequences of the fall. He pushes back the cause of the fall and he gives us a certain hope because Jesus has allowed us to know with 100% security that we will dwell in the perfected kingdom so long as we trust in his death in our place. 
See, one day we will be face to face with God. And what we are trusting in will determine whether we enter heaven or hell. Through God's use of technology on the cross alone, will we be accepted into heaven? Any attempt to earn salvation another way will result in damnation. And no temporary pleasures technology can bring now will ever comfort us in the face of the judgment we all deserve for our rebellion. So how does the Bible challenge us to relate with technology now? Well, firstly, it challenges us to avoid trusting in our use of technology and to instead trust in God's use of technology. To trust that God has used technology means to trust that the technology of the cross is the only technology that can save us because that's God's use of technology first and foremost. And to trust God's guidance on using technology is far better than our use of technology also. For me personally, this means I should be wary of when I'm tempted to put a bit too much hope in technology for lasting joy. See, getting the newest tech won't fix my problems. It'll be a temporary solution at best. See, technology is a great servant, but it's a poor master. It also means I can't be assured, it also means I can be assured that I am saved even when I don't use technology well. See, my salvation, it doesn't depend on my use of technology. It depends on God's use of technology at the cross of Jesus. And lastly, it means I shouldn't assume I'll naturally use technology for good. And rather, I should be questioning how God would want me to use this technology I have access to for his glory and his purposes. And I can do that because God in his graciousness has given us his word and he's poured out his spirit on his people so that they can read and understand how we might use technology as God would want us to in the Bible. How might I use technology to love him, to love others? And ultimately, how might I use it to proclaim God's technological majesty in using the cross to bring real, lasting and certain hope? So the big question that a biblical theology of technology poses to us is, are we trusting in God's use of technology or our own use of technology?
Uh, before we wrap up our time together, um, there's a few things to point out um, for our, our church family here. Um, if you uh, are new or visiting, or even if you're a regular, mm-hmm. the Connect slips are, are just uh, on the website uh, below the video. So if you could fill those out, um, any questions or comments would be in, or prayer points. Yep. Um, the uh, next week we'll be looking at a new series in mm-hmm. Daniel. Um, so if you haven't already, start to have a read through uh, the book of Daniel. Um, it's going to be exciting yep. to get your questions ready. Yeah, to get through uh, a new. Old Testament book yeah. and um, and do some more biblical theology, some more big picture of uh, God's uh, story. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, if you'd like to start meeting with us on Sunday in the building together, um, you can log on to the website and register yep. uh, for that uh, as we progressively, hopefully, God willing, move forward towards um, Everyone some meeting. sorts of some sort of back normality, yeah. back to normal, yep. whatever there's that is. A, there's limited spots, so just make sure that you do register your interest because um, we want to be um, COVID safe and we have to have everyone's name and um, do all the, um, yeah, everything by the book, mm-hmm. which is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, tonight um, Dan really helpfully just showed us that technology, like all things, is a good gift from God, um, and yet we often misuse it, don't we? Uh, so I think for me this week, I'm just going to be reflecting on um, how I use technology. You know, am I using it personally? Am I using it uh, for good and to glorify God, or am I misusing it? Um, how am I using it to build up those around me, um, and how am I using it to um, witness to those that are lost? Mm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we'll see you around next week. Next week. For Daniel. The book of Daniel. <laughs>